Happy weekend, everybody. This is Kevin, and you are listening to the 24th installment of the weekend edition of the PT Guru Podcast. Today, we're going to talk about risk tolerance and how it's a part of risk management. My name is Kevin Radzik. I've been involved in the field of calibration, measurement, and metrology for over 20 years. On the PT Guru Podcast, we discuss these topics and more like quality and equipment and how all this impacts your life. My intent here is to educate and inform, but most of all is to get you to think for yourself and not just blindly listen to the system. So I welcome you to the PT Guru Podcast. Welcome to the weekend edition of the podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in, hanging out, um, whether you're on the video version like we see here, um, YouTube, Facebook, link it from LinkedIn, some other places out there on the web, on the website as well. There's a link site from there. Um, or if you're listening on one of our regular podcast platforms. Um, for those of you that don't know, this is the weekend version of the podcast. We do it up on video here and just kind of to get you listening to what we do during the week. Um, so during the week, we're on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud. You can ask, ask Alexa, hey, Alexa, play the PT Guru podcast. She's going to do it for you. So first thing I like to do on the weekends is cover kind of where we've been during the week. And that way, if you're interested, something sounds good to you, you can go hit it up there. Um, and for this week, the first thing we talked about, we talked about, do you actually need accreditation? Um, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Uh, if you are looking to become a 17025 accredited calibration lab for whatever reason, there's a lot that goes into it. So maybe you should really give it some really deeper thoughts as opposed to something that sounds good while you're all sitting around the table having a marketing or a sales meeting. So just some thoughts about that. Uh, we did a quality toolkit Thursday this week and we talked about gauge r and Topic that's been around for a long time, kind of waxes and wanes through time, but um, what is it? What's it all about? How does it pertain to calibration versus just regular measurement situations? So fun stuff there. And then on Friday, we got uh, kind of uber deep and into some of my background stuff, and we talked about some calibration tactics, some ideas, some thoughts about some ways you can maybe help improve some of the things that you're doing, especially when you're dealing with things like getting your stuff calibrated, and especially if you're a calibrator of some sort, be it in a calibration lab or you're in a uh, in-house calibration provider for a larger larger organization. Uh, some things you can think about to do to try to make things maybe work a little easier for you. Um, so that's where we've been this week. Something sounds good to you? Hit it up on iTunes. Download uh, subscribe. You'll get to see them as they come out. So check me out and I very much appreciate it. Let's get right to some content for this week. And here's a scene that is all too common in today's world. Um, picture the production guy, gal, and the quality guy or gal. And there they are face to face at loggerheads and why you ask. The production guy says, ship it. It's fine. The quality guy says, no, we need to hold it and wait for test XYZ to come back. And the production guy says, I know it's fine. I've been doing this forever. The quality guy says, no, you don't know it's fine. The test didn't come back yet. And then we might need to recall product or something even worse could happen. Sound familiar? Well, this is what we're talking about with risk tolerance and risk management. These two folks here, the production folks and the quality folks, tend to have a little different view of risk tolerance. They have a little different idea of how risky they're willing to be. So this growing importance of of risk management in the quality world um, often leaves me a little puzzled in some folks' decision-making process. The idea of justifications of all sorts of things for the the sake of risk management is often haphazard at best and a justification for pet projects at worst, or even sometimes just gripes that people want to complain about. Um, The reason for all this is a small part of the puzzle that all too many people in quality fail to recognize. You can't have a risk management strategy without some form of risk tolerance 
strategy. Now, this might sound like an odd sort of thing to some of you because you've never been told that. That's unfortunately the case with a lot of this. But the truth is that all decisions have an associated risk. Understanding what those risks are is critical, but so is the action threshold. We can try to accommodate every possible scenario, scenario, including a zombie apocalypse, but that would be taking things a bit further than reason would dictate. We've all seen those videos on YouTube where a car crashes through the window of a subway uh, sandwich shop or some other store. Um, does that prevent you from getting your $5 foot long? I'm sure there are some folks out there that saw that and said, I'm never going to a subway again. And that's their identification of risk tolerance. Um, they've seen what happened and their risk management position is to completely avoid subway sandwich shops. Someone else is going to look at that subway before they walk in and assess whether or not they feel like a car could drive through the window and make a decision as to whether or not they're okay with that situation or they're not. And most people are going to say the likelihood of this actually happening while I'm in the store for a couple of minutes is well within my acceptable risk tolerance. Now, all kidding and illustrative references aside, understanding risk, risk tolerance is a key part of the risk management picture um, because we cannot possibly ma manage every single risk. It can't be done. Now, one of the really fun parts about the concept of risk tolerance is that it tends to be a very personal thing for a large number of us. So here's a little another scenario to kind of illustrate that part of the point. You go into the big box store, yep, you know the one, because you're in search of a toaster. Now, you need a toaster. You just need a toaster. You figure it's 2018. This should be a simple process. No real research needed here. Um, go to the kitchen section and buy a toaster, not really a life-altering purchase. Now, you're greeted with options. Too many options. Ranging from a no-frills unit that's $8.88 up to um, the special name brand, brand for $99.95. And all you want is toast. Now, aside from the obvious difference in features that these things are going to contain, um, what are you going to choose? Do you pick the cheapest? Do you pick the most expensive? Or do you choose something somewhere in the middle? Well, it turns out most people are going to buy something in the middle. In fact, in retail, it's a extremely common practice to put some super cheap version of a product next to a higher margin middle of the line product to prop up the sales of the mid-range product that often has a higher margin associated with it than the more expensive unit or the uber cheap unit. Um, but I digress from the marketing and business side and say that you really, most of you, avoid the cheapest one because your brain has been taught that there's a greater likelihood of failure of the device. Thus, you'll be bringing it back more hassle, or you'll just be throwing it away, waste of money, um, but more hassle. And then that middle of the road product is appropriately then priced to be of a higher quality than the super cheap product and is going to do the job for you. So standing there in the aisle of the big box store, you did a risk tolerance and risk management exercise in your head in a matter of a few seconds without even realizing that you were doing it. Now, the fun part, there's a portion of the population who would only buy the cheapest unit. End of story. Um, buy the one that's buy based on price, consider nothing else, and go about your day. Likewise, there's a portion of the population that would only purchase the most expensive unit because that must be the best and they want the best. And those are other approaches to risk tolerance and then risk management, albeit at sort of far ends 
of the spectrum. Now, here comes the hard part in the world of business um, and manufacturing, whatever the case may be. But when we look, work as an organization, we're going to have folks from all of these groups there. Handful of folks say, let it roll, sort out the pieces later, hence our production guy at the beginning. And then a handful of folks who are petrified with fears of all the what if scenarios, hence our quality person from earlier. Not that all quality people are like that. Not that all operations people are like that. It's just a scenario. Most of us, however, live somewhere in the middle ground. But we can end up being persuaded to lean more to one side of the spectrum than the other if there are no organizational rules or norms in place. And unfortunately, what this can lead to is this idea of some haphazard decision-making and haphazard approaches to risk management. And this is a bad place to find yourself because it just is tough to get out of. Um, because what we find ourselves doing at this point is listening to arguments on both sides of an issue that can be very compelling. They all have positive and negatives associated with them. So as an organization, decisions need to be made and made clear as to what the organizational risk tolerance level is. Sure, some people will still want to argue about that, that's everything, especially today. But on an overall picture, this gives us guidance. It gives us ideas of what to expect and how to react. Now, consider Six Sigma. Now, here I'm not actually talking about all the um, myriad Six Sigma tools, but I'm talking about the term itself. Six Sigma is an excellent risk tolerance system management policy because we look at a framework based upon DPMO, defects per million opportunities. It's a great framework. And with this framework, we're, we're saying we're willing to accept 3.4 defects per million opportunities. This is, this is acknowledging the fact that you can't get it perfect. There's no such thing but it sets a threshold for acceptable limits. So if you really want to get risk management right, consider a risk tolerance things a view of what you're looking at first, because this is going to give you a set of goals to aim for with your risk management program. Otherwise, you're never going to hit your goal because you haven't established one. If you got no goal post, you have no idea what you're aiming for. So if you're doing risk management, you need to consider the whole risk tolerance side of things that are going on. Um, hey, if you're listening to on the podcast or if you're on YouTube, Facebook, whatever, throw me a like. I really appreciate it. Helps other people get to know what we're doing here. Also, if you listen on the podcast on a regular basis, head over to iTunes, throw a rating up there. It, I appreciate it tremendously. And just say thank you to everybody who does in advance. A um, couple of really quick bits, a um, little bit of news from the PT Guru side of the world. Um, got a new DVD CD-ROM combo coming out. I plan on having kind of a pre-release ready um, in the next week, maybe week and a half um, from this kind of new venture I've got going called PT Guru you um, and it's measurement uncertainty basics and it's a combination DVD CD-ROM and it's also going to ultimately be available as downloadable content for purchase and will have basics of measurement uncertainty all the way up through calculating a single point measurement uncertainty and then actually doing a range uncertainty that could be featured on a Cal certificate or could actually even be on a scope of accreditation uh, if you are somebody looking to get accredited to 17025. Uh, so I plan on having kind of a first edition available up in about a week, week and a half, hopefully. Um, I would really like to get some feedback from folks on it. So I'm going to be offering up a handful of free copies if you'll promise 
to send me some feedback on the content of the uh, DVD and CD-ROM, the packaging, how everything looks, how it all flows together, what you think of what it is and all that. Um, and we'll probably be posting that up on LinkedIn as a free offer deal. Um, if you're interested and you're not on my LinkedIn for some strange reason, my LinkedIn is Kevin Radzik. You can find me there or you can actually search PT Guru. That'll get you there as well. But um, if you're not up on there and you're interested in obtaining a free copy of this thing, shoot me an email or a message via the website if you're interested and I will get back to you and let you know what's going on with it. Uh, so the website, www.ptguruconsulting.com. Um, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for spending some time with me this weekend. I hope I made it interesting for you. Uh, I hope you learned something. Hope you're having a great weekend. Hope you're having a great week. And I'm going to talk to you soon. Thanks.